Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to go ahead and pray before we start. i got to get my phone out of my pocket here. I'm sure no one wants to see that hanging out. Lord God, thank you so much for today and for the opportunity you've given us that we could come together and worship you. God, we pray that as we do, you would be glorified in what we do, and it would energize us so that we can fulfill your mission when we leave. It's all these things that we pray in your son's name. Amen. Okay, I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about some of my favorite movies ever. Star Wars. I love Star Wars. But I want to talk first about the beginning. So you start the movie, right? And if it wasn't for those scrolling words, you'd never know what was going on, right? Episode 4 opens up and Leia's in the one ship as a prisoner. No one knows why. It's in those scrolling words that go too fast for me to read. But they, they start out explaining what's going on, and even before that, they have one of the most encapsulating phrases to start the movie that you could ever find. It goes, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Boom. As soon as I say that, you know it's Star Wars, right? If you thought it was something else, I apologize. But it's very clearly Star Wars to anyone who's seen them. So there's certain phrases like that that just mark the beginning of an amazing story, right? There's, uh, there's the Star Wars, but most importantly, our Bibles. When you look in your Bible, which we're going to be on page one, I don't know if you need help finding it or not, but <laughs> Genesis chapter one, it's on page one, uh, we're going to talk about how God decided to start his story. Now, when you look at your Bible, it is technically 66 completely separate books for the most part, besides the ones that build on each other, like 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, stuff like that. But these are all completely separate books that really don't have a whole lot to do with each other when you look at them at face value. Genesis does not have a whole lot to do with, say, Galatians. There's not a whole lot between the two uh, that really makes you required to read that first. But when you look at your Bible as a whole story, then you can see how each part fits, right? Each book is a specific part in that. And so God starts his story, and it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's a pretty sweet statement. That's a pretty great way to start a book, if you ask me. They're not just going back to, you know, when Jesus started. They're not going back to when Israel started. They said, in the beginning, which is a super vague phrase, by the way, does not tell you how long. It doesn't tell you when. Uh, it literally just means way back when, right? Um, one of my favorite preachers named Tim Mackey says, this is the equivalent of back in my day, right? <laughs> so in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, there's a lot of questions that come up around these passages. Um, I'm not going to answer most of them. Sorry. Uh, but as you go through, you're going to see a lot of really important statements that are made. And that's because this is what the author was trying to emphasize. So he starts out and he says, God created the heavens and the earth. And what he's talking about is the dirt beneath your feet and the sky above your head. And that is exclusively what heavens and earth is in this statement. And uh, he says, everything between there was created by God. Everything around that, created by God. Now, the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So, again, I'm a nerd, I'm sorry. But uh, the phrase, the earth was formless and empty, formless and empty, first of all, really cool fact, it rhymes in Hebrew. It's tovu vavohu. Sounds really fun. Say it 10 times fast. Bet you can't. So <clears throat> one, of, one of my friends, when I was learning Hebrew, he goes, it sounds like you're putting a curse on someone, like, tovu vavohu, <laughs> like a little witch or something. Uh, he's a funny guy. But so we get that the earth was formless and empty, and this is used to describe basically a desert. There is literally nothing going on, right? 
and it says, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, and I always picture that that's why the ocean has like waves, because it's like, because the Spirit's breathing on it or something. It's kind of cool. And then we get into the real meat of the subject, right? And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Boom. I told first service I wish I could have done this, and then I thought about it, and it would have taken a lot more planning than I really wanted to. I wanted to shut all the lights off, and then when I said, let there be light, turn them all on, but there's like four light switches. So I wasn't going to be able to do that. Sorry. But uh, and God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness, and he called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Okay, day one, God says, we're going to set up time. That is what is happening, right? That's how our most basic form of time measurement is day, night. It's been one full day. So he creates this, and he starts by creating order through that, right? Because if we don't have time, we can't really measure when things are happening. If we don't have time, we can't really measure anything, right? And so he says, let there be light, separates it, and he says, there's morning, or evening and morning, the first day. Day two, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. That's super confusing. What waters? And then you keep reading, and it says, so God made the vault and separated the waters under the vault from the waters above it because there's sky water. I never think about that when I read this. Clouds are just water, right? So sky water and earth water are separated. He creates the sky. Then there was evening and there was morning the second day. And then God said, let the water under the sky be gathered into one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. And God called the ground land and he gathered waters or the gathered waters he called seas and God saw it was good. So we're through three days. Guys, this is a pretty quick story, right? So three days out of seven, uh, we've got God basically creating habitats. He created the sky, or he created day and night. He created the sky and the water, and then he separated the water and said, this is land. So then the land is produced, supposed to produce vegetation, um, basically plants that can plant themselves, Right? And then third day's over. God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night. Uh, And he goes through and he goes, that's a star, that's a star. We're going to create big, big stuff though, right? So he says, this is the sun, this is the moon. Sun, you go with day. Moon, you go with night. And then he said, and let me just put a little glitter on it. And he created stars. I think that's a pretty cool way of thinking thinking of it. Sky glitter. Uh, so then they all get put in the right spot and God gives them uh, the ability to govern the day and the night so that it's uh, going the way it's supposed to, right? And then God said, let the waters team with living creatures and birds fly above the earth. So in day four, he filled what he created in day one. And then in day five, he created stuff to fill what he created in day two. That's That's pretty cool. There's a real pattern going on here, right? Uh, And then we get to day six. Guess what happens in day six? He fills what he created in day three. He fills the land, right? And so he says, we're going to make a bunch of animals, and there's like five different words for animals. Uh, And then he's done. Is that right? You guys should be shaking your heads. No, that is not right. Day six got a little bonus creation that we call humans. So God said, as he's creating man, he says, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky and the livestock and all the wild animals and all the creatures that move along the ground. And then there's a little poem here. And then God created all of these and he blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in numbers. Uh, And then Uh, God told the people that they could eat any seed-bearing plant on the face of the earth, uh, and eventually he's going to make a different statement. But he says, or he looks out at everything he's created in six days, and he says, it's good. That's a pretty, pretty bold statement. I don't know if you guys have noticed people recently, but they're not all great. So we go through our first six days, and we see this pattern, right? 
God created habitats, and then he filled the habitats. And then we get to day seven. And day seven doesn't actually end, which is this huge uh, theological statement. But then we get to the next story. Now, this is probably along the lines of something you guys are familiar with. If you're not, I'm going to tell you it anyways. So Adam is hanging out in the Garden of Eden, right? He's the only person. And all of a sudden, Adam decided he wasn't happy just naming all the animals and the plants and getting to pet rhinoceroses, which I think is awesome. But he's just not happy with it anymore. He gets kind of lonely. And God said, I know what to do, Adam. And he says, I'm going to knock you out. It's a great response. So Adam falls into a deep sleep. God opens him up, takes a rib, and he creates Eve, who's supposed to be with him forever, which is awesome, right? And then we get into this wonderful story. So far, everything is good. So far, everything is really great, honestly. There's nothing bad happening. People don't die. Uh, they can eat pretty much whatever they want. And then we get to chapter 3. So chapter 3 goes like this. Eve is hanging out by this tree that God said no to, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? And she's just kind of in the area. She's looking at all the other plants around, probably picking berries off other bushes. And then this snake thing shows up. I don't like snakes, first of all. I would not have stuck around very long. I would have been out of there. But this snake thing walks up, walks, doesn't slither, probably like a lizard or something, uh, which is way more chill than a snake. But walks up, and then it starts talking to Eve. Guys, I would have been way out of there by now. <laughs> if animals start talking to you, you should maybe see someone. Uh, so Eve is hanging out, and this thing starts talking to her, and it says, Hey, Eve, you ever think about eating from that tree over there? She goes, Oh, no, 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 I would never do that. I would never eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, because God told us not to. Cool. So the snake goes, But did he really? I don't know. It sounded kind of vague. Maybe he was pointing at a different tree or something. And she goes, oh, you know what? Maybe you're right. You know, maybe that is the wrong tree. Let me start thinking about this here. And she goes, maybe, maybe I should check, right? <clears throat> so the, the conversation keeps going, and the snake says, well, what did God say would happen if you ate from that tree? And she said, well, God said surely we would die. And the snake goes, surely you won't die. That's ridiculous. You're supposed to eat. That's good for you, right? First of all, they don't actually know what death is, right? Because things don't die yet. So that's kind of a vague statement. Uh, surely you're going to die. That doesn't really mean a whole lot. But she goes, maybe I won't die. Maybe you're right, snake. That's talking to me, and I should probably be you know, cautious of. Maybe you're right. So she goes and she grabs the fruit, right? Uh, I like to picture it as an apple because all of the storybooks that I read as a kid pictured it as an apple. But it's a Granny Smith apple, so it's green. <laughs> so she picks this apple and she takes a bite and she goes, This is the best apple I've ever had. Right? And then she goes, Yo, Adam, check this out. And she chucks it at him and he catches, right? And he goes, oh, I wonder where she got this from. And then they're in trouble. They're both in trouble. So uh, story keeps going, right? They, their eyes are opened. They know wrong and right. And they realize they're naked, so they start hiding from God. And then God's like, yo, what did you guys do? How do you know that? And they go, well, I don't know. Someone told me. And God's like, well, what are you, what are you talking about? And so Adam goes, well, it's her fault. And she goes, it's the snake's fault. And there's just like this huge blame game going on, right? Like when you get in trouble as a kid and you blame your sibling. I did that a lot. Uh, and then God curses every, everything, right? Everyone gets their own curses. <clears throat> curses for everyone like Oprah. Look under your seat, there's curses. <clears throat> so then the story continues because this is what's crazy. 
This is all just in the scrolling words. This is a prologue. All of this is happening. And then there's even more that happens. Pretty much right up until uh, Genesis chapter 12 is the prologue. It explains why the world is the way it is. But we learned some really important things through this. See, a lot of times when we look at this, we're reading and we go, well, I want to know how old the earth is because of this. Or I want to know if evolution had anything to do with this. The Bible doesn't care. You know, it doesn't matter to them, right? They're trying to answer worldview questions. They're trying to shape a people's mind. So the answers or the questions that they're answering are, why are people here? Uh, why do people do bad things? Uh, is the world created good? All of these things, right? And we see all of these statements being answered. <clears throat> and so we, we end up seeing, first of all, everything was created good. When God created it, he said it was good. That's a pretty bold statement. Uh, people, especially, like I said, not always great. But God said they were created good. And then when we look into what else is going on, right? We see that when God created humans, he created them in his image. They were meant to reflect him. So when you look in Exodus and you see this commandment about not making an idol, that's the same word. See, we're not supposed to make graven images or idols of God because they were meant to direct worship to him. They were meant to reflect him. That's what an idol does. And that's why God said, no, that's not for me. Because we're supposed to reflect him. We're supposed to point people to him. That's a pretty, pretty important mission we've been given. And it all starts in those first, really the first chapter, right? And so as the story continues, right? Because we're going to kind of cover a lot today. We're going to go through most of our Bible. Uh, so we get this prologue. And all of this is going through. And we learn that people were created good. They were created in the image of God. Everything was supposed to work right. Uh, we sinned, and now everything's all sort of messed up. And then we even get told uh, in the Tower of Babel why people speak different languages. And uh, we get told a lot about why people just kind of are terrible, right? Uh, so then we keep going through, and the rest of Genesis talks about the creation of the nation of Israel, uh, and it leads up to Exodus, and then they come out of Egypt, and, you know, Lots of stuff, but that's not what we're going to cover. See, as we keep going, there's this gospel message, right? And as we're approaching Easter, we like to focus on it because we really like to talk about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection around this time, right? And that is the climax of this gospel. That's, this is the important part, though. That's not the end of it. And so we see that people were created in the image of God. He spent all this time... Uh, drawing this beautiful picture. I tell the kids in center shot this. Uh, imagine that you spent hours working on this beautiful picture, right? You used the whole box of colored pencils on this. It's amazing. You're so proud of it. It's the coolest thing ever. And then a little brother shows up. My brother did this, and I told first service he will never be forgiven. I spent hours working on this, right? I don't even remember what the picture was, but I'm still mad about it. I spent hours. I used every color that I had. We had the whole like pencil box full of colored pencils that I was using because it was important because crayons get a little oily and you don't really want to mess with that, but markers, they bleed through. So colored pencils, that was the right way to do it. And you go through, right? And I've spent all this time thinking through what I'm drawing, and it was awesome. I put it up on the fridge. It's I didn't get A's on tests, so I put my pictures on the fridge. So then my brother comes by, and he says, I think I could make this better. So he takes the picture, and he gets his marker. And like I said, markers, they bleed through. It was important that we don't use markers on this. But you see, when someone's trying to add to a picture, they hold the pencil or the marker like this, right? They use their fingers. But my brother, when he took it, he used his whole fist. This is important. This isn't a drawing way to hold anything. This is how you stab things, right? And so he takes the marker and he goes, 
I was so mad. But we've done the same thing. When we talk about the image of God in us as humans, sin has corrupted that. Sin drew all over it. And there's two responses to it. The first, you get some white out. You guys like white out? I hate it. It's the most useless tool in any office desk because you can't even write on it afterwards. It's just white now. And so you can get your white out out and you can cover the whole picture, right? This is what the law looked like. The law was this covering up. There are 10 commandments and all the laws that follow after that and these were all set not so that we could be considered right in the eyes of God, but so that we would recognize that we are wrong in his eyes, right? Galatians talks about that. The law wasn't meant to make people righteous. It was meant to show them that they needed Jesus. And so as you get the white out out and you start covering the picture, it doesn't fix anything, right? There's, there's a second option, though. You can take a picture of it on your phone, which I was you know, six. I didn't have a phone, so I didn't do this. Uh, and you can redraw it. You get all the colors you had. You can do all the work again. See, there's, there's two options when it comes to our image. We can work really hard at the law, and I can tell you that this doesn't work, because the people that did keep the law in your New Testament are called Pharisees, and Jesus didn't like them very much. And so the people that kept the law ended up missing the entire point of it. The people who relied on Jesus, they recognized what was going on. So there's two responses. And this gospel message that we get is there's a better way to do this. You don't have to worry about keeping all of the rules. It's not, there's 616 laws in the Old Testament, I think. That's a number I had to memorize at Bible college. Um, so if I'm wrong, you can take my degree, whatever. So there's 616 laws, and that's a lot of rules to keep, right? I, I don't even know that we really do great with the 10 one, the 10, right? Our 10 commandments. But <clears throat> the other option is you can recognize that that doesn't work, and you can rely on Jesus to shape the way that you live your life. When... A couple of months ago, I talked about worship and how the goal of worship was to reshape your mind. Uh, it was to spend time in your spiritual disciplines, to spend time with Jesus so that he would reshape the way that you think and the way that you act. And that's an important part of what we do. See, when I say the gospel doesn't just end at Jesus, it's because it doesn't. It continues after that. Otherwise, the last 23, 22 books in your New Testament would be worthless because Jesus isn't in them. He's mentioned, but it's mostly talking about how that reflects your life and how you should act in light of what Jesus did, how you should treat people in light of what Jesus did. See, the gospel doesn't just save us, it shapes us. As gospel people, we think about others we think about others before ourselves is what Jesus taught us, right? And so that's one of the things that we see through this entire, it's called a meta-narrative or a grand narrative, if you look it up on Google. Uh, and basically what it is is the entire story of the Bible and how it reflects each of us, right? How it shapes everything else. And so as we get ready to approach communion today, I want to challenge you guys. You, you might think of your relationship with Jesus as just your ticket into heaven. And that's not the way that he thought of it. You see, when Jesus looked at it, when Jesus died, he didn't think of it as you just, you get to go to heaven if you say yes. He thought of it as a way of shaping your life, as a way of showing your devotion to him, as letting him be the Lord of your life. So I'm going to go ahead and pray before we uh, do communion. Lord, thank you so much for today and for the opportunity you've given us to gather together to worship you, God. We pray that as we do, it would reshape our minds, it would transform us into your people, God, and it would just 
lead us to uh, a deeper relationship with you that we can share with the world around us. It's all these things that we pray in your son's name. Amen.